Yes, we're, we're going to go live now. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing podcast. I'm Mike Davis. Um, our guest today is Ceylon Baxter. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. You're in Scotland, so you're you're up late, but you assure me that you're not up late for me because you're a night owl. No. So, <laughs> so you would be up anyway. I would, definitely. Yeah. Last week we interviewed uh, the writer of the Left Right Game podcast, and uh, he was in the UK somewhere. I don't remember quite where. So he two in a row stand up late for us. So, um, so we'll we'll do introductions then in a minute. But you know, I just have to say, so you were you were the medium in the movie Host, and yep. in that movie they use Zoom, of course. Yep. Uh, you're now on a Zoom call with me and my fellow <laughs> panelists. Uh, yeah. Are you planning on doing anything and leaving? Should I be afraid? Or <laughs> I, I I brought my candle oh. and uh, you know I'm in the <laughs> same room, so we'll see. Okay. Um, well, you know, Jed's probably way ahead of me, but I think I'm going to suggest to him that there should be a whole backstory of your character and how you're you're uh, yeah, and then do a host too. <laughs> I think that, I think I, I could live with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, welcome to Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Whether whether you're watching live or watching later or listening later on iTunes or whatever, um, why don't we do introductions? Uh, Mike Davis again and Matt Carpenter. Let's why don't you introduce uh, yourself I, and talk about the prize? I'm Matt Carpenter, and we have a nice prize today. If you love poetry, there is a small cluster of poets of weird fiction operating on the West Coast. They are sort of the descendants of Donald Sidney Fryer. One of them is Ashley Diocese. And her hippocampus collection, Diary of the Sorceress, has some interesting poetry in it. You could win it by sending an email to ezineprizes at gmail.com and put diary in the subject heading. We'll choose a winner in a few weeks. Could be you. Could, be, could it be me? No. no. No, probably not. No, just screw up, Mike. Don't. don't bother. <laughs> Bridget. Hello, I am Bridget. I write music and create horror art stuffs and things. And Matt was shaming me for just sitting in front of the blinds. So I do have some bookshelves. <laughs> my my little art area. It's a nice living room. <laughs> I think that's the first time we saw your bookshelves. Yeah. 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 Well, I just moved everything down down you, here. You should be ashamed. Home. My God. <laughs> You probably have some musical questions for Ceylon later, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rick. Rick Lay, writer who just got a COVID vaccination. Oh, good. Good. The first shot or the second? First. They, Danielle got her first shot, Matt, the other day. Danielle's my wife, Ceylon. And on, on, on Thursday, on Friday, she was sick as hell. Uh, I mean, really bad. Almost took her to the ER. And then on Saturday, she started improving. And today, she's improving more. Just, uh, I had the same thing to the shingles vaccine. Some people get a reaction. Yeah. Feel like crap for a day. Yeah. It's 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 sort of like a, a badge of honor that you can tell people about until you're about 92. Aren't you 92? I Yeah, I got, I got sick from it. Did I tell you I got sick from my uh, shingles vaccine? You want to hear about it? No, I don't. Oh. Not not even a little bit. Oh. Um, <laughs> so you know, uh, mo uh, most if not all of my fellow panelists are creators of some some sort. So you know, um, go to lovecrafteasing.com, click on podcast in the top left. You'll not only see who's coming up in the next few months, but if you scroll down even further, you'll see our our panelist list. Um, not everybody's on every week, but um, if you click their, their names are hyperlinked. If you click their name, it'll take you to their, for example, if you click on Rick's name, it'll take you to his Amazon page and his books and so forth. So, um, and I, before we start, big thanks to my patrons for letting me do this instead of working in a factory or something. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, say so, uh, your, your website, just, you describe yourself as a Scottish Folk cellist, actress, and folk singer, right? Yeah, okay. I've not updated it for a while, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it wrong now? Should we change it? 
Uh, no, I haven't done that. Well, it's been a while since I've done any singing. Um, I used to tour um, as part of a band, part, part of a duo. But um, yeah, the performing's kind of taken a back seat recently. Um, yeah. But uh, um, music's pretty much your background your whole life, right? No, really? actually. Okay. No, before that, I was I studied languages. So I, I studied... Yeah, languages at university originally, and I travelled a lot. And then, so actually, the the music was kind of my second career. I, I did a another degree in in music, um, and wow. then the acting has kind of been like the third third thing. So yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, a short attention span, basically. How many languages do you speak? Well, I, I did three at university: I did French, Spanish, and Portuguese. So three to university level, but. Well, we, um, you, so you're, you've, you've done these two, you've had these two careers or occupations or callings or whatever. And then I, I read that in 2014, you responded to a Facebook post. You'd never acted before. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then you ended up in Macbeth. So tell us yeah. about that. That's really cool. No, yeah, I'd, I'd literally, I'd just moved here where I'm living now and, um, you know, it was the winter and, you know, there's not so much music work going. Um, there's no sort of festivals and things like that. And I, I met somebody that I, I knew from here and she said she was working as an extra in Outlander, which I'm sure mm. you've all heard of. And yeah. um, I thought, oh, that, hmm, I could do that. You know, I don't dye my hair, you know. Um, so I just went on Facebook and I just looked up her extras agency and then from there I kind of followed some links and I just randomly found this, I didn't know what a casting director was then, you know, and I found this link to a Facebook page and they were, it just said they were looking for Scottish women between 18 and 70. So it was like really broad and uh, sort of folklore, Scottish music, traditional dance, storytellers, that kind of thing. So I applied. If I'd known it was an acting job, I would never have applied because I, I, <laughs> I, I thought actors were really kind of outgoing people who like being the central. You know, I mean, I just I wouldn't have considered ever considered doing it. Um, and actually, I went for the first edition, and I still didn't know what the job was. I thought I still thought it was a a featured extra like background singer or something like that so it was only on the second edition that was actually with the director that I found out that it was to be one of the witches in Macbeth um so but then I was kind of like it was too late to back out you know? <laughs> um, but yeah and I absolutely I, I would never have considered doing it but I absolutely loved it and my very first day on set actually was um the big scene uh, so it was the the Macbeth with um um, Michael Fassbender and, and um, Marion Cotillard uh, and the very first my first day on set was the big scene where Macbeth meets the witches and I had to uh, you know sort of stand like that far away from uh, Fassbender and sort of deliver the lines and it was kind of yeah it was kind of weird <laughs> but you answer uh, a Facebook post and suddenly you're you're chatting with Michael Fassbender so yeah yeah <laughs> it, literally it was like two weeks later it was it was very strange I, I was going to ask you know what was your motivation for jumping into acting but it sounds like it, it just reached out and grabbed you basically it so. totally did I literally would not have considered doing <laughs> it um yeah I wouldn't have I mean I'd done a little bit of kind of you know theater in Spanish when I was at university like 20 years 30 years ago but yeah no I would never have considered it but actually I found I, I get performance anxiety quite badly mm. when I'm um on cello but with acting uh, with screen acting it's very different because you're just focused on the other actor you know you don't look at the cam the camera's not there and you know the the, um, the the everybody's working as a team you're not kind of trying to impress an audience who's right. you know um so I, I just I love the collaborative nature of it and the fact that you know the director you're kind of when the director's happy you're happy and I could forget about the cam I you know I couldn't see the hundred odd crew around me you just focus on the person you're you're with so I just absolutely loved it yeah I'm completely yeah upset addicted that's great um really uh but then how was the working with the director and the two uh, the it's two leads the, yeah fantastic yeah I loved it um really really nice yeah I, I mean, people then, I was so green, you know, and I was trying to find out everything and talk to everybody, but 
um, I, I remember somebody saying to me that um, it kind of kind of goes top down. Like if the director's nice and collaborative and you know friendly and um, wants to work as part of a team, then then it tends to be a really good atmosphere on set, and and that's been my experience so far, definitely. That so, makes yeah. sense, you know, and, and like attracts like so many times when it comes to people. Exactly. So the, the director maybe works with people he's worked with before and the head of department then picks their team. And yeah, so you, I actually haven't had any bad experiences yet. Um, I've been lucky. I know some people have. but Who's Lou Ridgely, Matt? Sorry? Do you know, does somebody here know a Lou Ridgely? Oh, oh that was um, someone just appeared on the uh, YouTube chat and said hello to you, Ceylon. It's Oh. Is, that, is it is it steve is it stephen i bet it i bet it's actually is it stephen maybe i don't know anyway, come back if it is <laughs> so anyway uh now i figured it was somebody you knew um so you fell in love with acting um so, what'd you do next i just want to get a little bit of background and then you know we can talk about host and doctor who sure yeah, so I mean, after after Macbeth, you know, after it was kind of all over, sort of, you know, like a month or five weeks later, I, I remember kind of writing to the, the, the casting director who'd cast me saying, what do I do next? You know, I was completely <laughs> great. Oh, he says, um, yeah, it's Steve. So there you go. Yeah, it is Steve. Hi, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, not met, but yeah, he's written to me. Um, yeah, so I basically then spent the next year, year and a half or more, just kind of like doing, you know, researching it as much as I could and doing every film going and, you know, everything, you know, like um, getting a showreel together, getting photos, you know, and then just applying to all sorts of things. But it actually took me a bit more than a year and then I got, I, I actually got on Outlander um as, as an actor just a sort of day mm -hmm. a day on set and then that kind of got me my first agent and then a year later actually via Rob Savage I got I got my current agent um so it was kind of a, a few years of really really hard work just doing the grind I mean the because the the film you know Macbeth didn't come out for it was almost two years like a year and a half mm. uh, but it actually came out and you say Macbeth and, you know, it's like it could be anything. It's like it didn't mean anything until after it was out. So it didn't help me to get any jobs or, or an agent or anything. So I kind of had to put in the grind. Yeah. Um, and I still am putting in the grind. But, um, yeah. Did uh, Jed, the director of Host, did, do you know him or how did you get involved with well, Host then? Yeah, Rob. Um, yeah, I, I worked with, with Rob, the director, and... And Dougie Douglas Cox, uh, the the producer, on a short film uh, three years ago, maybe um, down in London. No, four. It must be four years ago now. Uh, it's not actually. <laughs> it's not actually been made. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't finish it. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But um, I worked with them on that, and we ha we had a lovely time. I spent a week down in in London, and yeah, I ended up kind of you know I, I had my camera I like taking photos and stuff so I ended up doing lots of kind of behind the scenes photos of the crew and stuff and we just kind of kept in touch vaguely over as you do over Twitter so when when Rob brought out I don't know if you saw the the kind of two minute um kind of uh you know spoof that you know thing that he did no but I was going to ask you about it uh, yeah it was called so the, it, the it, zoom it, where it happened right well not, not that no no the um Rob's original um, Zoom call with his friends who are most of the cast and some of the crew of host where he pretended to go up into his own attic and I don't know if any of you have seen that yeah. Um, and yeah. then there's a, a scare yeah um, so I, I saw that and I, I, th I think I was on Twitter at the time because like I say I'm a night owl and it was kind of like one of the more <laughs> thing. and I was like Rob you are cruel you're evil how could you do that to your friends <laughs> that's terrible um, anyway, the thing went viral, of course, um, several million views. And it was it was a few weeks later, I, I, I just got a, a message from Rob saying, do you fancy getting involved in another little thing? And I was like, yes, because Rob is, he's just like, he's he's a genius, you know, he's, he's just, and he's a lovely, lovely guy. And likewise with Douglas, the, the producer, who was also producing. So 
I didn't even, you know, there was no quite, I didn't ask what it was. I just immediately said, yes, I, I didn't care if it was paid, not paid. Right. I just knew it was good, you know. <laughs> and so that was how I got involved in, in host. So I wasn't one of the kind of, you know, if you've seen any of the cast interviews, they're, they're, they're all kind of like, uh, they had this movie club and stuff, but I, I wasn't part of that. And part of the thing was that they all thought I was a real medium. So I didn't actually know the, the, the rest of the, the cast because they were supposed to think that I was genuine, but actually... What, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I did so, not know that. That's wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So he <laughs> when he said to me he was going to do that, I was like, you're kidding, because I'd never... I mean, I've, I'd never been to a seance before. Um, but I had to... Basically, I spent two weeks just like... I just wanted to really have a good idea of, you know, how it's done because... Because a lot of the script was, um, well, it was all improvised. Um, and obviously we didn't just do one take, you know, so there were several takes. And, and, and the cast were asking me questions because they believed it was real. So I had to have, you know, appropriate answers. <laughs> so I had to kind of, yeah, have a bit of knowledge of what goes on in, in seances. So they kind of knew that I knew Rob, but they didn't know that, yeah. They, they thought I was a real medium. Wow, I didn't know that. At what point did the rest of the ladies know that you were an actress and, the, and you know, he told them we want to do this film? Um, so he told Haley in advance, like the, the day before we filmed, um, I had a, a quick Zoom with, with Haley because she was supposed to know me. So they, um, he thought it would be better if, um, if we'd actually spoken. Uh, so so Haley and I would on chat on Zoom, we kind of exchange the odd message, kind of going, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> they believe you. Um, but actually it was that we had a little Zoom rap party and that's when the rest of the cast found out. And I was just, I was just so like really embarrassed. <laughs> what did they say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was more kind of me going, I'm so sorry. I'm really, really Oh, funny. really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... Well, because we actually did, you know, I actually kind of closed the seance for them a few times. Right. Um, because they were worried that actually it was a real seance because I was a real medium. And although we were filming, it was true. Therefore, they would get me to come on and, and go, OK, I'd like you all to just kind of visualise, you know, <laughs> and, and the rope and blah, blah, blah. And so I would kind of close the seance each night for, for the cast while Haley's kind of sending message going, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was feeling really guilty, but but at the same time I was thinking, well, does it matter if I'm a real medium or not? You know, does it matter because it's what you believe and you know stuff. So uh, they're, thought, they're suffering for the happening. for their art, right? You can look at it yeah. that way. I just had I just blamed Rob because it was all his fault because I wouldn't <laughs> have lied to them. I didn't lie to them. I just didn't. Tell them the truth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, you guys have some questions? I don't want to hog all the mm -hmm. questions. Uh, while we're on host? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Okay. Um, what about the Zoom where it happened? Tell me about oh. that, because I just learned about that today. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. It's a parody of host, right? Yeah, so it's a um, lovely chap called Jeff Whitmires, who, who's a um, kind of a... a yeah, he's a musician and 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 he enjoyed hosts. So he he did a a, a parody from Hamilton, the Hamilton, the the room where it happened, I think, um, and and made it into the Zoom where it happened. And then you know he shared it and kind of said, did anybody want to get involved? So we got some of the kind of host fans to get involved, um, and I and I did as well. So yeah, I just you know, but it was all, it's all his thing. I just, you know, said a few lines that, because in the, yeah. in the song, he's got quite a lot of Ceylon says, you know, so I said, <laughs> more. and then we did a, a little video and I got the opportunity to kind of be on the other side. So instead of pretending that I didn't know they were going to take shots whenever I said astral plane, because they didn't know that I knew <laughs> and I had to keep saying it. Um, I got to go and take shots myself and stuff like that. And the, Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna have to watch that. I just I I found out about it too late today to watch that. That's how you know you're a success, and you know when you're a huge success, they're already making parodies of it. Yeah. Know? So, um, so anything else about host? Just it was it seems to me like such a 
they, you know, Rob and Judd, they did such a great job because it's such a difficult way to make a movie, but it was really the only way, you know, that yeah. they could. And, and Gemma and Douglas, I mean, and, and uh, Douglas, the, the, the producer, I mean, if, you know, every, every time we were on, every time we were filming, I mean, obviously I didn't film as much as the girls, but, but whenever we were filming, it's like, you know, it, it was, Rob and, and, and Dougie the, the whole time and they just were looking tired and tired and tired. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were really determined to to get it done really quickly. So it was still relevant. Um, how, how long did it take to shoot the whole thing? I think it was 12 weeks from original. Wow. Yeah, That's... from original sort of idea to actually being on Shudder. I think it was round okay. about 12 weeks. It's... So that came together quickly, but the actual filming time is a lot longer than I thought. Um, I don't think the filming was like that much, like maybe a cu couple of weeks. What they uh, did first was they filmed the the kind of the, the scares and the frights first, um, uh, so that they could then go back and and kind of do it live on Zoom and have the the cast reacting to, um, you know, to sort of character. I hope it's not a spoiler, but deaths or you know scares and things. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much time it was. I mean, for myself, it was just sort of two days and then sort of one other day for a little pickup. Um, I don't think it was more than two or three weeks actual filming. What has it been like since the show, the movie has become such a huge success? It, it's, it's really odd because like, you know, if you do something like filming normally, you you know, you kind of, they go to the premiere and you're kind of it but it's like that you know you don't I haven't left my house you know it's just right. been, it's just been really really odd um just quite quite but it's almost like it didn't happen you know it just it feels really strange you know a couple of days in your house and also when we did it you know we didn't know that it I mean it's got it's had a lot of attention you know it's been on the news worldwide I mean the other day I've got a, a good friend in Spain who was like you've been on the news in Spain you know and that kind of thing and um yeah so you just kind of spend a few days in your house doing something and then it's just it's just kind of surreal really it's that's the, actually the word I was thinking yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's been the last year has been so surreal for like all yeah. of us for different reasons because yeah. of the pandemic it's absolutely so. yeah it's been strange and also it's kind of like you know there's been no acting work this year at all but then I did host but then I didn't leave my house you know it's just it, it, it's kind of it's quite strange uh any more questions on host guys um before we oh, I was just on? thinking about the not leaving your house that yeah it makes musical collaboration really difficult doesn't it hmm. I mean you have to have super high speed internet to collaborate like playing together oh yeah i haven't even attempted that i mean all i've done musically is is teach i do workshops sometimes i've done just started doing them over zoom but actually at the beginning of lockdown i was just doing videos and sending them out and then sending feedback videos rather than but i haven't tried to do any performances a lot of people have and they've been successful but i think it's difficult because you know professional musicians and amateur musicians have been putting things out online doing concerts so I think the people that were actually making a living through gigs um it's very difficult to to still make a living online when kind of everybody's doing it and people are fed up of um you know looking at screens yeah um and, and you know, there's so many people that are actually kind of earning the same but not spending money but yet the people that are working kind of entertainment and hospitality aren't earning money so it's all just been a it's all been just really weird hasn't it for everybody yeah definitely is uh I, th I think i told my wife around somewhere around christmas that if you would have could have been able to take a picture of you know any street in the usa pedestrians all of us for in christmas in 2020 and showed that picture to us in 2019 it would have freaked us out you know, yeah. majorly, everybody wearing masks, and yeah. Um, now it's just we're used to it. So, um, so uh, there's a little known show. Um, it's called Doctor Who, and you played a part on that. Uh, yes, Rick. Do you want to start with the questions on that? 
<laughs> or do you want me to? Liz, how did you get the role? Oh, do you know, I, I just call, I mean, it sounds weird, but I literally just got a call from my agent. I didn't have to audition, which was, I, I, I thought about this afterwards. I never asked the director or the producer, but I wondered if it was maybe because the role that I played, Tectian, it was such a big, massive spoiler um, for the, you know, for the whole storyline that if they'd put it out to audition and people had seen the script, then maybe the yeah. word would have I, I don't I don't know if that was one of the reasons. Um, also because it was a non-speaking role. So I suppose it's a bit harder to audition people for that. But yeah, no, I just got the call. That was it. Did, did you know that you were playing the equivalent of Doctor Who's foster mother when you played yeah. the role? Yeah, they sent me the yeah, they sent me the script. I was like that's a oh, huge oh, deal. It's like, oh, that's me. <laughs> that's strange. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, very easy. It's not always like that. Believe me, yeah. it's not really like that. Rick, you have some more questions? Oh, what the others? Well, did were you? Was it just you and a couple of other and and the the child actor, or were you on set with the other Doctor Who actors? Or how oh, did no, that work? No, 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 Jodie and yeah, the Doctor Who and the Master were that when we so would so I was sort of. It was three days filming, um, two days originally, and then another day a month later for all the green screen stuff. Mm -hmm. Although actually the second day we didn't end up filming. So it was, it's actually just one day. But um, yeah, the, the kid, the other kid, the, the first two children were there, plus the doctor and the master. And that was in the, a quarry near Cardiff. Um, so they were kind of, um, I think their scenes were maybe filmed from the front separately but they they had over the shoulder on, onto uh what were we we were doing and everybody was really lovely i mean it was just it was a really nice experience well um, what was it like on set and with them and just in general i mean honestly just really lovely because you know something like doctor who that's been going for i don't know how many years more than 50 you know a, a long time yeah um and you come on and you're there for a day or two, you would kind of expect, you know, I mean, people are busy, you know, they've got their jobs to do and stuff, but every, I mean, they could not have been nicer. Um, the producer was delightful. Jody walked up and saw me in the makeup trailer and walked up and not only did she kind of say hello and everything and make me feel welcome, she, she'd memorized my name and it's not even an easy name, you know, and walked up and went, oh, you're Sailor and lovely to meet you. And I was kind of like, that is above and beyond. That is just so, so nice. Yeah. Um, and then the director um, lunch the first day before I'd been on set yet, uh, walked up, oh, Sailor, thanks so much for coming. You're like, really? <laughs> Come on, I do this for nothing. You're paying me to be here. This is ridiculous. And um, uh, we chatted and he was just lovely. And then it turns out that we went to the same primary school together. So that was really nice. Really? And yeah, yeah. He's yeah, Scottish. And yeah, we went to the same primary school. And just, I mean, literally everybody I met, the drivers, and they, everybody was just utterly. I, I think I'm really most impressed by people like that, that are, that are very talented, successful, or both, that at the same time can manage to be really, really, nice people and exactly. empathic people so, exactly so i mean i think that are, i mean i'm sure there are some actors and I, I have met one or two that are you know i've kind of up themselves a bit they, they think they're really important but i think the majority are just yeah they, they, they tend to be nice people i mean you've got to have a bit of empathy and mm -hmm. understanding of other people really to be a good actor because you've got you know you've got to be able to portray different kind of you know, feelings and emotions. So you've kind of got to understand how people feel. And I suppose some people, yeah, I would say the majority are nice, but I mean, I, I, yeah, Jodie in particular was, was it was the kind of learning the name thing. I, I was like, really? That's I mean, touching, I know your yeah. name, but I've seen it in the press. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you, you didn't need to do that. That was, that was really lovely, but everybody, not just her, everybody was just lovely. Yeah, but, but, but that's very sweet. And that's what you remember most about her. You know, yeah. so that's, yeah, it's really impressive. Um, also impressive is, I refreshed my memory on that and, you know, watched your Macbeth scene and so forth. And, you know, you you didn't act before 
six or seven years ago. And as I was watching you, I thought, what a great actress you are. The emotion on your face, you know, without even saying a word in the, the Doctor Who role. Uh, it, it's just really impressive. So for it's funny. So I mean, it's funny when I started it, like I said, I, I would never have thought it was something I would want to do or be able to do. But um, when I started um, acting and I just kind of loved it and I didn't have the same kind of, you know, nerves, performance anxiety that I have with, with music, it just, lots of things seem to click. I mean, even silly things like, um, <laughs> so I, I play cello and, you know, apart from sort of gigs, I occasionally do things like weddings and, <laughs> and I would go to weddings and I'd be, you know, playing and you're, you're often, you're usually kind of near the front, you know, you're, cause you're up there with the kind of minister or the right. celebrant or whatever and the, the bride and the groom. And, and, and there would, there would be the, the bride and the mother of the bride and all the bridesmaids that are all dry eyed, you know, um, saying the vows and the cellist is in buckets of tears, <laughs> like literally kind of, <laughs> and, I and, and I was like, oh, this, and, and then suddenly I you know I started acting and it's like this is an advantage and it's one of those things that just kind of clicked it's like all that all these things that were a disadvantage and in, in other things like feeling things too much maybe sometimes yes. became an advantage in act sometimes I really have to tone it down like not think about the situation in acting um but yeah it just kind of it did kind of click for me um in a really nice way. The, the only problem is that it's unfortunately not something you can do all the time. You have to actually wait for other people to give you a job, whereas with music, yeah. you kind of organize your own gigs. So that's difficult. Now, uh, were you a Doctor Who fan before getting the role or have you always enjoyed the show? Tell, tell me about that. No, I wasn't. I mean, I now know what it means to be a Doctor Who fan because, you know, I did my research. <laughs> um, I loved Doctor Who when I was a kid and um, it it was, it was meant a lot to me to be on the show and it really did. I, I mean, I got to go inside the TARDIS, you know, it's like, wow. I mean, I did I did the whole kind of hiding behind the couch when I was a, a kid thing, um, scared of the Daleks. But no, I wasn't a fan. In fact, I didn't have a TV for for many, many years. I traveled and stuff and I, I, I didn't have a TV. So I, I missed decades of it, actually. Yeah. Who I, was the doctor when you were a kid? Uh, Tom Baker, I think. <laughs> He's the one I remember. Yeah, you're, but there you're must favorite, have been right? one. So I can't, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I came in about. No. Yeah. You, you I, know, um, sure. That would be like the, the sort of late 70s, 80s. So right. probably no better than I do. Yeah, that's it. That's it. it came into the seventies. I remember yeah. reading several decades ago that uh, when Star Trek: The Next Generation was about to begin, someone asked uh, Patrick Stewart. Uh, he wasn't a sir at the time, uh, of course, but, but they asked him, "How does it feel to be a part of of history? You know, of something so iconic?" And he said that was the moment when it clicked with him what what he was doing, you know, and what he was playing. And what he had to give to the role, and yeah. it meant so much to so many people. Yeah. You know, we're we're a storytelling species. So, and I bring that up because of you. You know, now your uh, your your character is such an important fig uh, figure in the history of Doctor Who. So yeah, it's it is really weird because on the one hand, um, I was kind of thinking, well, so I don't speak and, and traditionally in acting if you don't have a speaking role you're an extra um but then she's really important for the story and it, it was kind of it was a bit weird. I kind of almost didn't know how to sort of f f feel it yeah um, I mean I, I reckon I was totally blown away um and it was also all very kind of um it was all very last minute actually we, we were actually um <laughs> on holiday we just we just left on this grand pre-brexit tour of, of Europe um, and we were we, we were on the ferry to Norway when I got the call mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like to go to Cardiff in a week and I was like okay <laughs> um, so it was all kind of yeah very last minute but it was yeah like I said bizarre it's like it still blows my mind you know um, in a way maybe not so much because I it, 
I don't know. It's like, I, I, it's not me. You know, I, I don't think of it as being me. I think of it as being tech to you. And that's really yeah. cool. It's, it's not me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, um, so. I feel very, very, very honoured to, I mean, to have had any part in Doctor Who is just, you know, it's amazing. Not it's, everyone it's, can say that. Never do yeah. anything else than, you know, I was, I was in Doctor Who and it's just, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, it, it's, it's, uh, the Arrowverse, Matt, the um, Legends of Tomorrow, that's the show I'm trying to think of. Uh, I remember reading that in the first season, uh, the guy who was, uh, I forget his name, uh, um, uh, not Clara's husband, but uh, Amy Pond's husband, Roy, the guy who played Rory, he kept he kept reminding them subtly that he was on Doctor Who, so I think they built a, a Dalek or something for him. So, And, you know, not, not everyone can say that, so... <laughs> And literally no one else can say that they uh, discovered the doctor. You're the only one. Yeah. So. I know. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's like, if it wasn't for me, like, yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. <laughs> very, very, very strange. Plus, she's kind of a, she was a cool character to play, even though I didn't get any lines. Again, it doesn't matter because, you know, she was a scientist, an explorer. Okay, she might have been able to treat her children a little bit better. Um, she might have got a little bit obsessed and single-minded, <laughs> but um, but she was certainly a kind of interesting woman. You, you know, it was yeah, yeah, it's an interesting character to play, definitely. Yeah. Well, and of course, it's it's kind of divided fans. You know, uh, totally. Um, some people think it's a really neat reveal and twist, and others don't. I asked the ultimate Doctor Who fan, Rick Lay. Um, what he thought of it. And I think you said that you were fine with it, Rick. I'm fine with it. Yeah. There, there have been a lot of contradictions. You know, there was even an American TV movie with Paul McGann as the doctor, which said uh, his mother was an earth woman. It was a plot line that went nowhere. We probably you know, shouldn't go anywhere. River, River said the doctor lies, rule number one. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean... It, uh, you haven't gotten any uh, uh, hate mail or anything like that. You said uh, Chris Chipnell. Am I saying his well, last name correctly? I, I mean, I, I've read a lot of... Um, on, I mean, obviously, I kind of looked up a lot. I've been on Reddit and all the sort of forums and things, and I've seen yeah. a lot of people have been really unhappy about it. And it's something I can't comment on because I'm not a fan, you know, and I, just, I mean, I don't like it, but I'm not a fan. Um but I understand, I mean, I, I learned enough to understand completely why people feel that way. But there were also a lot of people that, that liked it because they thought it respected the canon and so on. But um, I have had some, you know, letters and so on, and they've, they've been lovely. They've been really nice. There's been, I mean, hopefully anybody that doesn't like the storyline doesn't blame me for it. <laughs> but um, there's, there's been some, some, yeah, some really nice feedback as well. Yeah, well, it's a show that's meant so much for so many people. They grew up with it, you know, and then it comes back in 2005. Yeah. Uh, they're very happy about that. And, um, you know, it's easy to dismiss that. But, you know, let's, you know, the kid that grew up in the 60s and 70s or whenever in the 80s and had a tough life and one of his or her escapes was watching Doctor Who, that's okay. very important. Yeah, I mean, even somebody like me who who didn't follow it, you know, uh, you know, uh, since I was a kid, I didn't follow it. I, I missed a lot, but um, it's still massive, you know. It's still, it it was really, you know, it really affected you when you were a kid. It, it was the only thing that was kind of really kind of impactful in that way. So I totally respect anybody that feels strongly about it. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, when as soon as I kind of arrived on set, they were all kind of, everybody on on the you know cast and crew were talking about the universe and you know and everything and like like what a you know what a thing it is like how welcoming it is actually and and how people are really you know lovely and um, yeah about it a lot. Well, yeah, um, I forget who it was that said that uh, you know you can. The, the only invalid criticism is I wouldn't have done, done it that way, you know, and, and, and criticism is, is, is valid, you know, if they grew up with Doctor Who and uh, that's not the way they, they, that's not the way, what they prefer, that's fine. But I think it's an interesting 
it opens up a whole new universe of possibilities. I'll say that. So. Plus, they, it could it could always you know it could always have been a lie, and you know who knows. Yeah, exactly. I hope, I hope not for for my sake. I, I like it. <laughs> Rick or anyone, do you guys have any more questions while we're on Dr. Who? Well, what's next? <laughs> yeah. Are there any projects you're working on that you can talk about? No, absolutely nothing. I mean, the, the whole lockdown thing has been, yeah, it's been a bit rubbish, really. Yeah. I was, I mean, last year I had, you know, I, I am quite new to acting. It's building up and last year was quite good. And then this year I was thinking, oh, this, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm Dr. Who and, you know, um, but yeah, no, it's all just gone. <laughs> yeah. Apart from most, <laughs> no, nothing's happened. So um, then you never know with acting. You just don't, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but um, not, nothing exciting that I can talk about. Well, it seems like you have a knack for sort of accidentally falling into <laughs> cool things on when it comes to oh, acting. Absolutely. We'll see. We'll so see. maybe that will happen again. Because I, I think also that the whole, um, you know, for actresses that start working when they're like 20 or 18 or whatever, I, I think my age is a really difficult age to be acting because you're, it's that middle-aged thing and people don't. So, I, I mean, in a way, maybe kind of it's interesting to have just started because it's a kind of a, a, a fresh, you know, and, and I don't maintain the smaller roles, you know, because I'm not... Um, a household name so I think there's maybe sort of certain opportunities because of that um, but yeah we'll see I mean I'm, the thing is you get greedy I mean for the first time when I started acting I understood like rich people like millionaires that just want more money and more money and more money <laughs> because it, the more I act the more I want you know it's like now I've been in Doctor Who so what's next you know what's next <laughs> And you just get really greedy and 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 what I just love doing it. I don't like seeing it after. I don't like watching myself. I don't care about what happens after, but it's the actual doing of it that that I love. Love it. So so we can watch the host. We can watch your part in Macbeth. Do you have any clips or whatever of your musical performances? Um yeah, yeah. Um I I do. I mean I wouldn't say most of the clips that are available online are are, are, are necessarily our best. We had a, a couple of unfortunate occasions when, like one time when my cello broke and then somebody videoed the whole concert and that's probably the first hit you'll find. Um, How in the world did you, your cello break? Um, it, <laughs> Not like vigorous. <laughs> yeah, um, my my musical partner, who's now my my boyfriend, my, my, my partner, um, We'd just done the sound check and my cello was plugged in with, you know, with a um, a, pre um, a pickup, and he tripped over it, <laughs> and the cello just went like that, and uh, it ended up with the the action was about there, so I was kind of trying to play it like this. Oh my gosh! Feared that it would actually fall apart any second. Um, and and the whole thing was video, <laughs> videoed, and I think it's a top hit. But anyway, the 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 duo is called T Tatty Jam. If if you want to look us up, Jewel um, Coat. Hmm? I'm sorry, Jewel Coat. Or the, the name? No, Tatty T A T T I E, and then Jam. So Tatty being the Scottish word for potato, potatoes, because my partner's name is really Pringle and like potato Pringles. <laughs> and then okay. my name is Baxter and I don't know if you know Baxter's jam yeah it's a bit corny but I like it <laughs> thank you <laughs> hey you did a short film um called best man I did yeah and it yeah. won an award I believe and I haven't had yeah. a chance to watch it yet or or find where to, to watch it but can you tell us about that yeah that was that was way back sort of early roads. I'd, I'd done Macbeth, but it wasn't out yet. And I was looking for showreel material. Mm -hmm. So I'd done some student films, but I was kind of looking for something, you know, a, a, a good scene. Um, and so I did a, um, I did a search of, of like um, people's favorite acting scenes and, and somebody, uh, this is a bit of a spoiler, but um, I saw the comment that, um, what's it called? Love Actually, Love Actually. Yeah, and the scene where um, Emma Tom 
that's the right film, isn't it? I've got a terrible memory. But so. Emma Thompson's the Christmas present and she's kind of like tearful but doesn't want to admit it. And I thought, that's good. I'll just take that situation, that'll be a good 30 second clip and I'll just expand it a wee bit. And then I thought, oh, I may as well make it into a short film while I'm at it. So I made it into a kind of 10 minute short film, really just for a showreel scene, but... Okay, yeah. this is completely unrelated. I was just listening to The Birkin Tree that oh. is lovely. What oh, a beautiful you. performance. Thank you. Very catchy too. <laughs> yeah, well, what we do is kind of, or what we did, um, uh, it's kind of, kind of, yeah, funky kind of, funky folk, I suppose. Um, and really, I mean, ha about half the material's traditional Scottish and half of it's written by him. He's one of these annoyingly clever people that, um, he's also a writer, by the way, which I, I know some of you guys are, are he's yeah he's one of these annoying people that writes composes songs and tunes and he's a he's an author as well and um he's kind of good at everything <laughs> looking through your filmography i saw you were also in a set in creed uh, no was that no i know you no, that's uh, no that the director of macbeth uh, directed that as well but no i wasn't involved in that You've you've done a couple of audio books though, I believe. Right? I've done yeah, I've done some audio books, and actually, I think yeah, um, I I just kind of got involved in that relatively recently. Um, and the first one I did was um, um, because my my partner's an author, um, and he does science fiction and different things. But um, it was a, an author friend of his, Gary Gibson, and actually, it's kind of a a ghost story actually it's called ghost frequencies the, the a novella was the first one i did ghost frequencies ghost frequencies okay. yeah by gary gibson and then i did another one i think you know the um crossroads press um david wilson um so i did one through them um craig specter and john skip deadlines oh yeah john um, yeah yeah, so horror. I mean, it's funny because I actually, I, I, I actually don't like horror. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> I, I get terrified by horror. I just like I get really crazy at kind of blood and violence and stuff. But I kind of seem to have ended up with it. So I've done that horror, and then I did another short um, part of an anthology on horror as well. And then am I allowed to do a plug for another narrator because uh, it was him that kind of told me to um, get in touch with you, but Joshua Saxon, he's written, he's narrated a lot of horror stuff, mostly via Crossroads Press as well. And I'm just completely addicted to um, his narration. So I've, I've actually listened to quite a lot of horror mm -hmm. via him. So I kind of have more of an appreciation of it now than I, than I did before, I would say. But I definitely enjoy narrating it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I was about to ask. It sounds like you enjoy the doing the audiobooks. So I do, I do. Um yeah, it's kind of it's you get to do the acting and you get to kind of play all the different roles, which mm -hmm. is really nice. You don't get typecast, you get to play everybody. So it's really fun. I've I've had to I had to put a kind of temporary stop to it because basically this computer just like was dying on me. So I Got a new one arriving next week, so you know <laughs> it, it's scared. it's one of those things that's harder than it looks. You think, oh well, you know, just read it into a microphone, but it, there's so much more to it than that. Absolutely, know? and yeah, it takes so much longer than you think, uh, especially yeah. if you're doing your own um, editing as well. And I mean, fortunately, because of the music background, I had a lot of understanding of the you know the um, the software to edit, but. Um, yeah, a lot of people think, yeah, you like you say, you're just reading a book, but no, it it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, fortunately, I found the actual sort of reading aspect of it. You know, I I enjoy it. It kind of it feel it feels quite natural. It's just a bit like the acting, but yeah, yeah. All, all the other things like organizing it and editing it and so on. There's there's a lot. Of, yeah, it takes a lot of time. I, um, yeah, I would imagine so. So how much of that is on you then? Like when you deliver the recording of your voice, how much are you having to edit yourself? At 100%. <laughs> really? That's so interesting. Yeah. It's a good thing that you like to do editing. So. Um, or you I don't. Do, 
I mean, I really enjoyed editing the the, the short film you were talking about, Best Man. I yeah. I basically learned how to use um, Adobe Premiere Pro because I long story, but um, the 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 material, the filming was in such a state that I couldn't really get anybody else to edit it for me um, the way it had been filmed, not by me. Um, so I thought it'd be better just to learn how to use the the editing software. So I edited it myself and, and really enjoyed doing that but the the audio bit recording I don't mind the editing too much but I would much rather have somebody else do it <laughs> <laughs> I, I much prefer the the reading side of it but you know it's it's just having the kind of and I know any professional narrator will say you have to farm out the editing to somebody else but hmm it's okay if you've kind of got savings and you can kind of take a punt on that with the royalty share book. But um, if, if you don't have that, then you just got to kind of bite the bullet and do the editing yourself. Yeah. So I think I do it fine, but I, I don't love it. No, I don't love it. I don't love listening to my own voice. I maybe <laughs> would enjoy editing somebody else. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being on the show today and, I sure. and, and being here and talking with us. Um, I don't know if you've thought of it this way, but, you know, I admire, it's it's like my wife. I admire so much what she's done. She used to be an attorney and she just, she wanted to be a teacher. So she was an attorney for a number of years. Um, and now she's a high school English teacher. And I just think that takes a lot of courage to, um, you know, follow a new calling in, in midlife like you have done and like she's done. So. I do, I have to say though I mean I I don't have kids so I think it's a lot easier if you don't have um, oh, yeah. responsibilities like that. that that yeah I kind of admire people that can can do that and have family responsibilities too so I I've kind of avoided certain <laughs> responsibilities so that I have that that freedom and also you have to kind of not mind being poor you know to take a part on true. something new. and I don't mind I, I, I Money's not important to me. I would much rather do something I enjoy doing than have money in the bank. I see two uh, mini series and series listed in your filmography. One's called The Victim and one called Nothing to Declare. Yeah, so the Nothing to Declare one, that's actually, yeah, it's kind of an interesting new concept. It's, um, it's basically kind of performed audiobooks. Uh, the book streams, books office. I'm not sure what their kind of official title is, but they they kind of um, they they get a cast of actors to perform an audio book. Um, so they have a narrator and then they have a cast. So I've done two with with those people. That was over lockdown. The victim was a was a TV a BBC thing though, where I played a um, a jury the jury spokesperson. It was a, a really good four part series. I, uh, last, I, I, I was just going to say, too, that um, I've told this story on, on the show before, but when I was 18, my, my aunt and uncle, they got me this job working in a factory in, in Texas. And the job was for 10 hours a day, you stand on an assembly line and, you know, you take out your various tools and as these things come down the assembly line, you, you your quality control, so you make sure they're up to specs with your little measuring tools. And... A lady came up to me I was like I said 18 or so at the time and she was probably 40 and she said do you know how lucky you are getting uh, a good job like this at 18 um, it pays really well which it did and she said and you know it, it, it's great job security you know so she thought she was encouraging me but actually my heart sank and yeah. I was just imagining myself standing on that assembly line till I was 65 <laughs> Life, yeah. And I was like, yeah. I can't do this. I didn't walk off that day, but it was it was pretty soon afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I've been this. I mean, I one time in my life uh, for a few four years, I had a kind of a pro proper job. Um, I worked in a um, paper mill, and I worked in the export department of paper mill. And I mean, there was things I loved about it. I I, I, I was basically in sales. I was in, in in sales and I traveled a lot laterally and that was really nice. It was really nice meeting people and, sure. uh, you know, talking to people and using their languages and seeing different places. But yeah, just the idea of just always doing that. But I think it depends on your priorities, you know, your priorities might be to 
you know, have the latest whatever and the nicest house or, or yeah, you know, yeah, no, no, I, I'm not, I'm not judging anyone who does do that and is able to do that, but I just relative to important. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I particularly um, empathize with people in in the U.S. and other countries. I mean, at the moment, still, fortunately, let's see how long it lasts. But at the moment, we still have, you know, the the NHS. We have healthcare and and education and so on that's free. So, you know, it's still tough if you if you don't earn much. But um, at least there's certain things that that we get um, regardless of our income. So I, I recognize that it's easier for some people. Than, than others you know well yeah i mean you know my wife does go to a job every day just to use her as an example again but it's a job she loves and she's making a difference so yeah. and if it wasn't for her my son and i wouldn't have health care you know so so yeah um unfortunately yeah it's a sore subject with me it is that way in the united states and i don't feel it should be you know i i'm jealous of you guys so <laughs> well we're, we're losing it so i mean oh are yeah. you oh my gosh <laughs> Don't start me on politics. Okay, I won't. <laughs> anyway. Um, you can't top yeah. our politics. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ours are worse. Oh, I don't, yeah, I know. It's, yeah, that's been mental recently. It's just crazy. Crazy. It still is. It's, crazy. it's 2021 We're now. We're going to hope for the best for this year. So. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for, pressure, for talking yeah. with us. And um, yeah. Yeah. I wish all the best to you. You're a very talented lady. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Nice Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you. Yes. You too. Take Bye. care. Have a good night, Bye. someone. You too. Bye. Bye. Well, she was great. You got to you gotta listen to that song. I put it on the uh, easing page, The Birkin Tree. I will. First of all, the, the song is really pleasant, but she plays the cello and she sings. And she's <laughs> incredible. Oh my lord! I will. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, you will too, Bridget. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. I'm copying the link that Matt put in the chat. <laughs> well, I've got a bit of news. Uh, okay. As you guys know, since you're here, we're recording this on January 31st, 2021. Tomorrow's February 1st, uh, and tomorrow Lovecraft Easing is officially 10 years old. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Happy birthday to us. Yeah, exactly. Mike, Mike, just I'm just saying that like in Middle Earth, when a hobbit has a birthday, they give out presents. Yeah. To all of their closest friends. Yeah. Well you are so I just uh, think, you know, the easing just you know, I'm just I'm just putting it out there. Well, you know, you run movie nights, so think of yourself as you can handle that part of, of, of it. So I'll, you know, I'll leave that to you. You can give everybody presents. Uh, it needs to come from the top, or the emotional impact's not nearly the same. <laughs> it's like, what an empty gesture. Matt gave me something. <laughs> Shit. Actually, it's more like, oh, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, Hector says, doesn't Matt give out the prizes? <laughs> exactly. No, Matt doesn't give out the prizes. Matt is getting rid of stuff to make his wife happy. That's what's really going on. <laughs> See, he's not, not denying it. <laughs> she likes me, maybe. I'm not. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, so, we're our thirtieth anniversary is in a few months. Oh wow! Happy anniversary. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, uh, what are you guys watching and reading? I'll tell you what I've seen and what I'm reading. First of okay. all, uh, Kelly Young recommended. A movie called The Empty Man to me, and I really liked it. If you, I mean, if you're looking for solid answers and, and so forth, you won't. But um, I thought it was really, really good. You, I think you you can rent it on Amazon, which is what I did. And um, I guess I'll throw out the standard: don't watch the trailer or read about it or anything. Well, it sounds to me like it might be something for movie night. Yeah, I think so. It's 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 definitely weird fiction. Uh, I think there's a bit of Philip K. Dick in there, too. Hmm. So it was a very interesting movie. And, uh, yeah, thanks to Kelly Young for recommending it. I, um, it. It starts off with it with, with what I thought was a little bit cliche, but then they, they make it their own. Uh, you know, if you, if you blow on an empty bottle and make a tone, um, 
in, in, in a bridge or something like that, then the empty man will come to you. Uh, the first night you I think, see him, the second night you hear him, or vice versa, and the third night he comes to you. It's a really, it's a really good movie. So, um, yeah, check that out. Um, Mike DeBronzo, if you're watching this, you are really, <laughs> really wrong about Synchronic Man. It was terrible. Oh, no. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't terrible. But you know, those two, those two guys. The uh, was it as bad as Lake Mungo? Oh, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> uh, the The Endless, I thought, was much better. Um, you know, and they had a smaller budget then. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, I mean, if I would have, and I'll say the same thing about Tenet, if uh, which I saw earlier this week too if if i would have stumbled across synchronic or tenant on netflix and just watched it in the you know um i would have thought oh that was that was okay that was, that was watchable um but you know christopher nolan and then these two guys i just synchronic is not cosmic horror it's basically a, a kind of simple time travel story so uh, which is okay but um Anyway, have you guys seen it yet? Synchronic? No, but uh, we were going to watch it on movie night until someone ruined it. I mean, so yeah, <laughs> watch The Empty Man instead. You'll I it. mean, we've watched worse, so why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Good> point. <laughs> I guess I can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, it would be oh. wrapping up the storyline, well, sort of. Oh, sorry. Point. I'm just now looking at the side chat. Uh, Danielle wants to get rid of things like you're doing, Matt. So. She wants to get rid of me? She no, she wants to get rid of all my books. Jeez, Danielle, I, I, I'm i sorry. Whatever I said, God. All, all our spouses want to get rid of all our books. That's true. That's true. So maybe, That's uh, probably true, uh, but so, I'm married to a drummer, so I have collateral. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was about to, I, was, I was about to say, you might be the exception. Really. <laughs> so anyway, so if you, Synchronic, Tenet, and The Empty Man. The Empty Man was definitely the best of the three. <laughs> What is Tenet? I don't know what Tenet is. Tenet is kind of time travel too, but it's basically um, reverse entropy. You know, why does time travel in a in a in a uh, towards the future instead of the past? It's it's got some deep concepts, but then you know, it also has something. They're 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 explaining the grandfather paradox and acting like it's this really deep thing, and I'm thinking thinking I knew about that when I was eight years old. It's it's not a bad movie. I just expect better from Christopher Nolan. So anyway. There was a lot of there was a lot of eye candy in as far as action scenes and everything. My grandfather's paradise, you mean what if you killed your old grandfather? Yeah. yeah. Which is back to the future more or less. Yeah. Yeah. So um anyway. Uh Matt, you you guys watched a 30 minute what was it short film called Sound of the Deep that you said was yeah. very Lovecraftian? Last night for movie night we had a YouTube special. We watched short movies available on YouTube. So most fans of this series know that uh, we all like the movie AM 1200. We watched that again. Mm-hmm. It still holds up. It's still very Oh, I'm sorry. Well Matt, done. I forgot to say the guy who did AM 1200 directed it is yeah. the director of The Empty Man. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, buried um, the lead there, but. Well, now then, I want to watch it. <laughs> then we watched Dear David, and uh, then we watched Sound from the Deep. And Sound from the Deep is overtly Lovecraftian. Um, it is, sh- it's like 30 minutes free on YouTube. Well worth the watch. Uh, Creeping, creepy, disturbing, interesting ending, very surprising. I, I liked it a lot. That's great. You it's think, on Bridget? YouTube and Sound from the Deep. Right. Okay. What did you think, Bridget? I thought it was interesting. Yeah, it reminded me at first a little bit like um, Sea Fever, but then not. It was interesting. I liked it. Kim Smelter says a lot like the temple. So. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I, that that's fair enough. I that's a fair comparison. Yeah, you got glared at. Is Bryn, is Bryn Mark in the room with you? <laughs> Mike came around the corner and glared at me because <laughs> I was talking about his drums. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So, sound from the deep. All right. Now, 
Uh, my wife's watching and she's going to kill me for telling this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So as far as what I'm reading right now, I'm still reading, um, I'm still working on The Twisted Ones by T. Kingfisher. It's a really good book. So I've got it on Kindle and I used a credit to, you know, Whisper Sync it on Audible. So when I go to bed, I can, you know, cont continue to quote unquote read it. And it's a, it's a very good narrator, uh, female narrator. And uh, apparently there was a really, I've read it now, but there was a really scary scene after I fell asleep with it still going, I think two nights ago, and scared the hell out of Danielle. And she's, she, it, and then I read it and la later and I was like, yeah, that's pretty creepy. That's really creepy. And um, she said, I said, how did you get scared? And she goes, um, well, your arm was like above my head or something. And then you moved to put your arm on me in, in your sleep. And I like shrieked so <laughs> because of that scene. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Right, honey. <laughs> so anyway, if you haven't read the Twisted Ones, I'm here to add to your TBR pile because it's, it's really good. I'm about halfway through it. Um, what, uh, I don't know. What are you guys reading? And watch and or watching. Well, I finally saw the uh, Wolf of uh, Snow Hollow. Great, that and I liked that a lot. And if you wanted to see something that may have influenced it, it there was a movie made, a TV movie made in the seventies called uh, Scream of the Wolf, which was great for the first two thirds and then fell apart at the end, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But it was made by the, uh, directed by the creator of Dark Shadows, Dan Curtis, from a script by Richard Matheson. And then sort of in the style of the first two Cold Cack movies. So you may find that that's an, an interesting thing to watch. I liked it better sort of on the second when I just recently watched it, but when I saw it, I was disappointed by the ending. Okay. I was curious how other people would feel about it. It's only about an hour and fifteen minutes on Prime Video, free. And then what's the title again? Scream of the Wolf. Scream of the Wolf. With Peter Graves and Clint Walker. Okay, it's funny that you mentioned the Kolchak movies because I was thinking the last few days I need my, you know, Kolchak movie Night Night Stalker um, fix. I haven't watched the movies in twelve months, so. I'm going through a thrall. Yeah, you, you, this would be a good substitute. Okay. Okay, this is for Mike DeBronzo. <laughs> I started the Doom Patrol. And I'm slowly going through it. I'm like five episodes in now. Um, I actually didn't care for the first episode or so because I really... I am tired of origin stories and superhero shows. You know, yeah, like me just, too. I, I can... Screw it. Just... just Throw them into the action, right? But uh, this is this is really kind of interesting that um, you know none of these people are particularly noble or particularly brave. Um, it's enjoyable enough. Another thing that I actually don't enjoy is um, the way this this popular conception of what it means to have a multiple personality disorder. The idea that you could have sixty four separate personalities each with a different superpower i actually find that that's a drag on the story you know the, the uh, switching that, person yeah suspension uh, of belief on that is pretty hard right plus also it's actually not what that the phrase doesn't mean what people think it means um yeah and uh i just i, I just find it to be it would be just a lot more narratively simple if she was just a person. Poor DeBron was batting a thousand 60, tonight. Not 64 per, but but it is in, it's an enjoyable show. Oh sure, throw um, the bone. No, it, it is. It's just <laughs> it's like um I like it, I'm not loving it. Uh, but enough that I'm keeping it going. Bridget, what about you? What are you watching and reading? Well I can blame Matt for one because I started watching Evil. I like that. It's is interesting. It? I, I saw it too. I finished it the first season. Oh, you finished it, that? It, it's it's, a, it's a series, right? Yeah. And where, I, where is it's it? Inter 
it's so interesting because they have the priest and the skeptic and then you never really know like what's going to happen is and it I, being I real I've, I've, I, I get scared for the kids throughout yes. the whole series oh man <laughs> is this on Prime? Uh, it's, it's on both Netflix and CBS Soul Access okay. yeah Netflix is what I'm watching it on yeah. All right. It's good. I like it. I really like the the characters because um, you have to. Sim- I don't know. For me, anyways, I have to sympathize or empathize with the characters a little bit. You know, they don't have to be perfect, but I have to at least find them interesting. And, well, and that, that Rick's right. You're right. That bit about the kids, perhaps. You know, that's like. Uh, it adds the scariness factor. Um, even if it is a show on American TV and you think, oh, they'll probably be okay because it's American the, TV. The Halloween episode had me on pins and needles. Oh, gosh. Right. Yeah, that was... Even wow. though I guessed, I guess what the unmasking uh, was going to be, if you've seen that. Sounds like I really need to watch this show. It's good. I, I liked it because it definitely wasn't an in-your-face paranormal story, which I found refreshing compared to a lot of the other stuff that I've been watching, so... Yeah, it, it, it's super well acted too. Very, yeah. Oh, speaking of horror series, Nathan Ballingrad um, will be on next Sunday, and uh, cool. for the audience, we'll be talking about his book, um, North American Lake Monsters, and the series Monsterland comes from that book, which I believe is Hulu, if I remember right. Yeah, I, I've watched Monsterland. I've got to read his book. Okay. I get the impression there are some differences. Oh, I mean, okay. Sure. I was wondering too, Rick, because it does it does seem like I'm missing something sometimes, and I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to be missing or not. So, yeah. Uh, well, I, I was also well. There were episodes of Monster, I like Monster Land, but there were some episodes where I would end with, "What did I just see?" Like the second one was the shadow. Yes, I liked the first. I was one. To... Wait, what shadow? I like shadow people stuff. Yeah, there's the second episode, uh, the shadow person episode. Oh, okay. Right. We gotta and, go. And yeah. how it and how it ends is is just it's got a I'll say it's got an ambiguous ending, I'll put it that way. Yes. Even better. You, I'm glad I wasn't the only I one. I've been great talking with you guys. Um yeah, I need else. to go watch Monster Land. I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's done really well. Totally. Well. It's done, I've read interpretations of it, which kind of fill in the blanks for me. But I was going, what what does happen there? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I'll have to talk to you offline about it later. So I've, I, I've, yeah. I've got I've got two series no now to watch: Evil yeah. and Monsterland. Mm. Yeah, I'll do Monsterland first because uh, I've read the book a while back, but I haven't seen the series yet, so I'll, I want to get it all in before. Next Sunday. Um, One episode yeah. I would say was Lovecraftian. Okay. Oh, the other thing I. I, I wait, 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 wait. What? what? Okay. One episode was Lovecraftian. <laughs> Period. Stop. Yeah, I don't want to know. Del, anymore, Del, Del was underwater horror. I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay. What, what do you mean? I don't want to know. The, anymore, the one that deals with underwater horror, the one that deals with the oil spill. Anyway. Uh, I forgot to mention a listen a, a very kind uh, Lovecraft easing uh, friend of Lovecraft easing. Let's put it that way. Um, I had mentioned that I needed help selecting a new Kindle. Not that I have the money for a new one, but um, gotta do what you gotta do, right? Um, and um, he kindly sent me one uh, new. And thank you for that. You know who you are. Um, and also. Um, it kind of it made me remember the Stephen King short story Er You Are, if you remember that, uh, which which came out kind of when Kindles were pretty new and, and a novelty, and it's a really good story. So Universal Reader is what it stood for. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, Matt, did you tell us what you were watching and reading, or did I skip you again? Um, well, we mentioned uh, what we were doing on Lovecraft Easing movie night. Um, next week is Synchronic. Cause, uh, Did you add me as a moderator yet? Yes, but uh, I am having... I got to say, there are some people who say they're not getting into the group. 
and I've not received any new requests for membership showing up on my feed at all. I'll check it out. And uh, that one person you had mentioned, I wrote them an acceptance, you know, it's like I accepted them in technically and they said they never got a notification that still said their request was pending. I really don't understand what's going on. I'll, I'll see if I can solve the problem. It's fine. Um, if you're interested in joining us on movie night, um, just go, um, if you're watching on, on YouTube or listening somewhere else, I've got the link in, in the show notes and it just basically, it says all of craft easy and links and leads you to a link tree. If you scroll down on the link tree page, um, one of the links is uh, movie night and it'll take you to cast and you can ask to join the Lovecraft easy and movie night group. So, uh, it, Matt starts it, uh, at nine 30 Eastern time, uh, every Saturday night. Pretty much. Right. Right now we are, uh, listening one episode at a time to the BBC series. Um, I think we are going to be on episode 10 of the case of Charles Dexter Ward next week. Yeah. So you we do, play- you do warm up uh, stuff too. Yeah, before that, I was playing videos and stuff, but um, some people have expressed an interest, so basically I'm playing these to myself, but, you know, uh, it's great. Um, At any rate, if there are movies that you want to watch, um, we've seen a lot of movies over the last several years, but if there's a movie that you think we ought to watch, just suggest it. Um, We'll put it up for consideration. Eventually, we get around to just about anything. Um, there is a movie that just got reviewed. I gather it. I, I'm not sure if it's streaming or not. I, I, I hope it is because this is such a great review. This is on uh, Bloody Disgusting it's Sundance Review. A movie called Com- Coming Home in the Dark is the nihilistic morality thriller. And it just looks like a really, really good movie. And I can't find it anywhere. So maybe. It, it's just at the film festival, but who knows? If anybody has information on that, let me know because I want to watch this. And then there is um, who's the guy who did Midsummer? I think it's the same Midsummer. How do you say oh, that? Ari Aster. Uh, well, I don't know if this is him or not. Um, there's a new movie called uh, In the Earth, um, and this is off FilmSchoolRejects.com. This, I'm, I'm quoting, this is not the flowery and bright folk horror of Midsommar or the Wicker Man. This is a dark, utilitarian folk horror constructed through recycled tarps and old netting. Sticks are used to create sigils, but ropes are made from tarps. Eye coverings are just pieces of paper. And he- headdresses are crafted, are crafted from blue netting. It is the rituals of the old gods meaning a modern world as natural resources blend with recycled man-made materials, blah, blah, blah. Well, it sounds interesting. So, and it sounds Lovecraftian, so who knows? I I don't, it, is that even on IMDb yet? I don't know. It doesn't know. sound like the In the, in the in Earth, the earth in uh, the from earth. 2021. Actually, the descriptor here says, as the world searches for a, vi- a cure to a disastrous virus, a scientist and park scout venture deep into the forest. Yep, that's the one. Okay. Yeah. So it's called In the Earth. Um, and I did, I did watch, I did get to watch uh, One Division, Rick. I've seen it through the fourth episode. So what do you think? One Division's awesome. So well, I, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. yeah. It really, I mean, it built slowly to a fourth episode with the, so far the big payoff. Yeah. We have a bigger payoff down the line, but... Uh, we can't really talk about it really at all, obviously, without giving, without spoilers, but yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, but I've, I've, been, I've never seen so many theories on the internet about <laughs> who the hidden villains are, and I'm going, no, you're going too far, it's not going to be that guy. Pete told me, Murray said the other day, uh, that he was crying in the first three minutes of... Uh, the fourth episode, yeah. and uh, I see what he was talking about now. Yeah, yeah. So I was really happy to see Darcy Lewis. I think I can say that without spoiling anything. See what? Dr. Darcy Lewis. Darcy Lewis. Oh, oh, oh. Kevin Feige introduced that character at uh, one of the promotions, so we knew he was going to be in there. Yeah. Uh, so did, anyway, they, yeah. they did a lot of. They brought back. A, they brought it back very well because he was sort of like. Yes. 
looked down upon as a character, but he was, he fitted in very well with that whole episode. That's great. All right. Anything else, guys, that you want to mention? I started watching the fourth season of Sabrina. How is it? it? Oh, I know. I well, when I first started watching Sabrina, I was like, "Ugh, I can't do it." But <laughs> I have to say, it grew on me. It it's your, your resistance got beaten down to a nub. This is like Stockholm syndrome. It does kind of grow on you, but I think I'm, I think I'm done. I'm like almost done with the first season, it's, and I'm it's losing me. Well, the first season I actually didn't like very much, but there's some big payoffs in the second season. And the third season was fun, and now that they're into Eldritch Terrors in the fourth season, it's it's entertaining. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't want to start it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gave up like after the second episode, I think I, originally, and I'm like, I no. And then I went back to it, and I was like, oh, okay, well, it's getting a little better. And then, Did, but do we hear about Archie and the gang? Is the main thing? No, but they do make references to River, Riverdale. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so. and I kept wondering. I'm like, are they gonna go over to Riverdale? Because <laughs> I can't say without spoilers, like why they mentioned Riverdale. But there was a there was a one of the serpents that showed up in one of the episodes hmm. from Riverdale. Yeah. Did you see the one with the weird? The that is the next, shh, that's the next episode. Okay. <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. The end of it, the end of the second one, leading up into that, is cool though. So I'm excited for that episode. Yeah. Well, thanks, all, guys. all of the Eldritch Horrors have names that were either movies or uh, books. Uninvited was a ghost story from the '40s. Was Rain the Land, and uh, I forget who was the. I forget what the first Eldritch Horror was. I think Ray the Land was in that great movie Frogs. Yes. It's just, it's a brilliant piece of cinema. I don't know why anyone watches any other movie. Are you being serious? Well, it's it's better than <laughs> Hell Came to Frogtown. Hard to tell with that <laughs> I think that's the first time Rainbow I've ever Land's, heard it. Raymond Land's best horror movie was The Man with the X-Ray Eyes. That was pretty good. Not as good as Frogs. Well, this is a bit of a shorter. At least you episode, didn't say the two headed, tra- you know, what that two headed transplant movie he made it was Rosie I, Greer. <laughs> His head got transplanted on Rosie Greer. Yeah, he had two heads. What was it? Was Rosie Greer's body and head was Ray Milland on it? You could have saw that. The thing was two heads. I think that's what it was called. The, the, he didn't. He did. They did. It didn't get the Oscar. <laughs> no, it did not. The, hi- the, really the highlight the here is, um, brain, is Rick going, are you being serious? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks, guys. I'm in a bit of a flare-up, so I, I know this is a bit of a shorter episode than normal, but um, um, it's starting to get better. So Some things okay, are, so some things aren't. Just remember, if you want to read some Eldritch poetry... Uh, Ashley Diocese is an up-and-coming star. Her book is Diary of a Sorceress. Email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put diary in the subject heading. We will draw a winner in a few weeks. Maybe it'll be you. All right. So uh, to my patrons, thank you for for keeping Lovecraft Easing running. Uh, Ten years tomorrow, we started the – I started the Patreon – I think roughly two years ago, something like that. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. And um, if you're not a patron, you get a lot. Of, you get extra podcasts and um, um, a lot of a lot of stuff. And it's just five bucks. Starts at five bucks a month. So just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon, or you can follow the the link in the show notes uh, where it says all Lovecraft Easing links. So it's on there. So. Uh, thanks for keeping me uh, keeping me running, and thanks to you guys for being here, and to the audience. And if you're in the audience and you haven't watched Monsterland yet or read um, North American Lake Monsters, go ahead and do that because we'll be talking with Nathan Bellingrad next week. Nice guy, and a very talented guy too. So, 
So anyway, thanks, and we will see you guys next week. All right.